Welcome to the Nerds Podcast number 773. Hey, Katie, guess what? What? This is a bonus episode. What? Do you know what that means? It's an extra special bonus episode? You just repeated what I said, but I you added know. extra special. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's no... There's no ad? There's no ad. I'm not going to drone on about anything except for the fact that there's no ad and the fact that I'm not droning on. So I guess technically I'm droning on. This is Alex Winter returning to the Nerdist Podcast. Alex, of course, you probably know from uh, Bill and Ted, among other things, but... Alex is a fantastic director. He was on before when he was uh, promoting the Napster film, and now he has a new film called Deep Web... Sorry, Scout was licking Lydia's water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Scout licking my fiance's water bottle does not change the fact that Alex's movie is called Deep Web. Yep. It- <laughs> and uh, this, this was fascinating. Oh, this- it was so interesting. Yeah, Alex is great. So I was very happy to have him back on. So we're going to get right into it. And uh, now Scout has formed a bond with Lydia's water <laughs> bottle. We're going to go... Uh, lavish attention and affection on Scout because that is just too goddamn adorable to an- ignore. And here's the Nerds Podcast number 773 with Alex Winter. Katie, roll the thing. Please. Now entering Nerdist.com Hey man, hey, yeah. how, how are you? you? Hey, hey how are you? How are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. Excellent. You're looking incredibly dapper. Do you always walk around looking super dapper? I just got done with work. Right. We just shot the show at midnight, so um, I am. I'm in show. And You're I'm in dinner. dapper mode. I'm in dapper mode. And I have a dinner after this. So nice. I, uh, is it a dapper dinner? It's not. A, mm. It's not a dapper dinner, but it's just that my other clothes was basically a Futurama T-shirt and some jeans. And right. So I figured. Right. I'm why also, not look nice? Why not stay classy? Just throw yeah. the Futurama mm. T-shirt on and then put the blazer on. You're like cool. Rich and then guy. I'll push my <laughs> sleeves up and be a comedian. For oh games. God. <laughs> yeah. that, that Do was your the look. Tim Allen routine. <laughs> yeah. The look was the the uh. '80s comic look was jeans sneakers. Blazer over a T-shirt, pushed up sleeves on the blazer. Horrible. I also saw a lot of sweater. That wasn't just comedians the neck. too. That was like all kinds of people. So it was, <laughs> that really was a lot of. That people. was just awful. Yeah, there was sweater around the neck too. I saw a lot of comedians. So a lot of sweaters, sweaters around, around the, neck. the neck. Yeah, I think Seinfeld was guilty of both of those looks. If I remember oh, correctly. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 he did. Oh, a lot. He would sort of either do the sweater I mean, or he, the jacket with the sleeves. He well was the New York the comedy scene. Yeah. yeah. But I think it was allowed because Seinfeld was a good show, yeah, and he, he just carried that look over from the '80s. But yeah. well, now he still he performs in a suit now. It's horribly on it's, horribly it's uh, <laughs> unsavory now. Still on the top of the comedian's annual earning list, Seinfeld. Now, do they take into account residuals from Seinfeld into his earnings? They must. Yeah, yeah. It was, sure, it was, syndication is yeah. going to be crazy. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I, the Hulu deal alone. Larry David and him each got, I think. But even without that, I mean, just before four hundred million dollars. Any syndicated show is just insane. Yeah, it's a residual. Oh, it's such it's such a good business. Plus, Seinfeld is never not yeah. on. It's always on. Yeah, yeah. But that was really sort of the, with the exception of maybe Big Bang Theory and Modern Family. It's not. There used to be a thing in television Five where it's years, like hundred episodes. If you just get to a hundred, mm-hmm. you're done. golden. I know. You know, and it's not. I don't know if it's quite the same. It's not. Anymore. No, no, it's not. Business has changed. Yeah, completely. Yeah. <laughs> but you're a director. You don't have to worry, worry about, about all that, that shit. shit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever miss it? Do you ever go, oh, maybe I just, maybe I'll just act in one more thing just for the I fuck mean, of I'll it. do the third Bill and Ted, obviously. So. <laughs> there you go. Is that happening? Uh, it's still, people still want it to The happen. last time you were on, you said, yeah, Reeves and I talk about it every once in a while, but it hasn't really materialized. Yet. A lot has happened since then. Really? It's been a couple of years since I saw you. It yeah. has been a couple of years. Yeah. yeah, a lot has happened since then. That John Wick movie. Oh, oh, we basically now. put the movie together since then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's M- fucking... Money, a director, a producer, and a studio. That's huge news! I can't talk about it in, in total detail, though. Well, those, so, that's enough detail. Yeah. Take those details. Listen, you don't we're have to give me close. the details. Just tell me when it's coming out and take yeah. my money. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, we're, we're getting close. We, I just watched – Bill and Ted's is one of those movies I watch every once in a while. Like I have a, yeah. a rotation of movies that I need to watch every so often. Yeah. Just watched it a couple of months ago. T- completely holds up. 
It's yeah, fucking it's crazy. great. Yeah, it's just there's so much sincerity to it. I think, but it's uh, yeah, we're working on it. We are uh, actively in it at the moment. So, and I, I also whenever just... time travels involved in something, it ends up holding up just by virtue of the fact that you release yourself to floating timelines. <laughs> I think if it's, I think if it's a comedy, I wouldn't say the same for the sort of romantic dramas in, in the time travel. None oh, of which you probably sure. even remember. Like a time traveler's because wife, they, just, if you will. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> or or, or <laughs> yeah. maybe that one. H.G. Wells' Time Machine. Well, I haven't rewatched. H.G. Yeah. Wells' Time not so Machine bad. holds up. Yeah, that's not the so bad. The original holds I, up. I mean the remake, not the... The Guy I, Pierce one? That one does not hold up. No, 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 no. I have not watched no, that one. No, it's Christopher... Is it uh, Christopher Plummer? Who is it? It's... Uh, Malcolm McDowell in the original, yes, yeah, yeah, which is yeah, yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Well, time after time, was that's time, time after time. time with Malcolm McDowell and David Warner. That's the one I'm thinking. He's of. chasing uh, I love that Jack one. the Ripper through time. That's Mary the Steen one I Virgin. like. Yeah. That movie is fucking awesome. Yeah, when I was a kid, I absolutely loved that movie. It is such a great. It's still good. That's another one that's always. But, but he's H. G. Wells, isn't he? Isn't one he of plays H. G. Wells? Yeah. And I know David it's Warner. not the Time Machine, but it's 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 like a riff on Wells's, like a fictional look at Wells's. Yes, adventure. His whatever. idea. His idea that right. you know that the the future. Nicholas is, Meyer. I think. Is that who did it? I'm pretty sure. That Nicholas the, the, Meyer of Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan. I'm pretty sure it was the, Nicholas the Meyer. The future is utopian, director. but then all of a sudden it's actually not dystopian. Yeah, I mean it's not utopian; it's dystopian, and so it's more of a world for Jack the Ripper and not H.G. Wells. Yeah, it's like when Homer Simpson has that toaster, that's pretty good. When he gets the up. toaster, and then he goes back, and then he just starts bashing everything <laughs> because he's tired of fucking up the future incrementally. And then he oh, has the so perfect life, and he leaves because there are no donuts. But then it starts raining, and it rains donuts. There's so many good Doctor <laughs> Who, like the Doctor Who reference. The, do- the like the phone booth. Yeah, that that alone, I was in love with it just based on that alone. And then the movie happened to be great. That's fucking great. You guys are talking about that. I'm so excited. Not yeah, talking. yeah, well, we're getting close. Wheeling so. and dealing over here. He's he's awesome. He was on a, last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kenner was on last year and really cool. And yeah, yeah, he's awesome. He was just in a he was in a movie that uh, Eli Roth did. Knock knock. Knock knock. Yeah. And I I couldn't I had to stop watching halfway through because. When I saw where the movie was going, it yeah. stressed me out <laughs> so fucking much. Yeah. I can watch all kinds of horror. Mm-hmm. All kinds of horror. But when there's that kind of psychological drama where someone's life is about to get horrendously fucked up, yeah. I cannot deal with it. My girlfriend had to watch it. My fiance, my fiance had to watch it without me because I'm like, it's too it's too stressful. It's gonna oh god. Like it meant to hurt the pit of my stomach. Yeah. It's excruciating. He delivers this amazing speech at the end though, so you have to watch just for just, that. Just watch it's, it for it's that. So great. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well I'm very I'm very happy to hear that. Congratulations. Well yeah, we'll we'll see. We're getting there. You know what this crazy town is like, but we're getting Listen, we're getting I think it's a wonder close. anything fucking gets made. Exactly. Are you kidding yeah. me? I mean it's like if you you can even get to that point, you're already doing yeah. well. Well that was the comedy of the of the the first two. You know, it's like some so many people have been saying to us along the way, it's like, Oh, it seems like it's you know, it's it's uh, why wouldn't just a major studio pick it up and do it? And and the other two were independent movies. I mean, they weren't studio movies. They were they were movies that the studios would never have made in a million years. You know, really? they, no. The first one was made by was was funded by Dino De Laurentiis. Oh uh, wow! And then he went under, and it was and it w- sat on a shelf for two for like a year and a half, two years. And we were told it, we were told it was done. We were told that movie's never coming out. Wasn't it a monster? The first one was a monster hit though. That, but that's the funny story. So we made it for Dino. It sat on a shelf because he went – he bankrupt – I think he would like – it was money laundering scheme. He would bankrupt his companies like every year and a half. It was like his, his bookkeeper would call him and go, Dino, it's time. Flush. <laughs> now I will and then he was the army of darkness. <laughs> exactly. And a year later, he would open a new company and start again. And that was just, I think, the way, the racket that he was in. But uh, – so we sat on a shelf. We were both told the movie was shelved, that it was not going to come out. Know. And then um, it was bought out of – out of the the funeral home by a tiny little company called Nelson Entertainment for one million dollars. The oh entire my thing, God! And they made a fortune. Oh my God! So that was what happened with the first one. And the second one we made for Orion, and uh, then Orion went the bankrupt. Late, great Orion. Exactly. It was the same thing all over again. We didn't get shelved because by then they knew they that it was probably going to do pretty well. And it was put out. I remember how it was released, but it wasn't uh, ultimately Orion. Um, so it's never really been a studio thing so oh, yeah. we had to really get creative with it my best friend from high school storyboarded what was originally called bill and ted go to hell oh yeah uh and he had the original placard from when he would drive on to the lot that said bill and ted go to hell and yeah he was like oh they changed it because they didn't want to say go to hell but yeah i think it was peter hewitt was that yeah the peter hewitt yeah. yeah my friend robbie consing who's a genius storyboard artist and a director he he storyboarded that movie it was like one of his first jobs ever oh, out of so high great. school was doing bill and ted go to hell uh and now here we are in 2015. 
<laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad. But you, uh, so the the last time you were on, I think you had teased. Did you tease that you were working on this? Yeah, or, yeah. I was working on this. I was working on Deep Web, which is I'm now working on another movie, but I'm. Deep Web is now out, and I've been festival touring that since March in South by. How is it? How is it giving a TED talk? Is it nerve wracking giving a <laughs> TED talk? You have a time limit. Mm-hmm. There, there's a. Uh, you know, are people generally friendly in the audience, or are they so analytical that it's? It was it fun. Here's the funny thing. I've I've uh, I first went on stage when I was ten years old. That was when I started in the business, and I w- and I went on a stage. I did uh, Oliver with Vincent Price at a theater in St. Louis called the Municipal Opera, which has got, I don't know how, it's got thousands and thousands and thousands of seats, right? And I was on, I did theater my whole childhood on a stage in front of an audience, no problem. You, once you break that, you break it and you're fine. I've had to memorize lots of pages of stuff. So you think, been on stage, memorizing, this is going to be a cakewalk, no right? No problem. I mean, I said to the guys, like about... You know, I started rehearsing it a month before I did it. That was when they approved my speech. That was a month before I did it. And about four days before I did it, I was like, I can't remember if you can curse on your show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's like, how the fuck does anybody do this? I'm like, I'm an actor for fuck's sake. I have more experience memorizing shit than anybody this is the most terrifying goddamn thing I've ever experienced. Well, the fundamental like, difference is that you're not saying Dickens' words. You're saying your words, and it's your project, and you have to be you. I mean, that, and you can't, and you have no, like, you have to get your message across. So I'm not, again, I, it's true. I'm not reciting somebody's dialogue. I'm like, I have, I had 12 pages of stuff to say. <laughs> it was extremely complicated. Um, and... I had no notes and I had no margin for error and I had you, they they say you got six you know fifteen to seventeen minutes you cannot go over we would prefer if you don't go under meaning if you forget half of it you better start riffing dude <laughs> <laughs> because, because, where you from yeah you're you're in front of a sol, you know a sold out massive theater right balcony the whole bit with nine cameras trained on your face and there's somebody who's just you know and you walk into the green room. And it's like – it's not like all high fives in the green room. It's, like, it's sort of like – I imagine what it would be like when you go to witness somebody being executed and like the family <laughs> comes out before you go in. It's like the guy comes downstairs and he's just like a shell. He's like gray. And, he, and I'm just like, that went pretty well. He goes, did it? Did it go well? <laughs> this is like thousand-yard stare. There should be a TED Talk about TED Talks. Yeah, and then he just kind of walked off. And, it, and this is, I think he probably jumped off a balcony or hanged himself. <laughs> You know, and then you go on, and then there's somebody you know waiting, for, and and it was really funny because the second before I, I literally, the second as I was walking on with the footlights like out, that was in the wings. I walked on, the whole thing went out of my head. Oh, the whole shit. thing, all twelve pages were completely gone, and but I was then, like, I was like, you know what? I'm either gonna ha- it's either gonna have been in there somewhere, like in my subconscious, or I'm screwed. And I opened my mouth, and the whole thing came out. Yeah, because you, know, <laughs> the, you had to riff on Bart. Hey guys, yeah, oh God. Bart, right? It's, <laughs> it's really hard when the, when the fear chemical kind of floods your brain. Yeah, it just creates a barrier between what you know right. and because your first response is, I either have to run. <laughs> Exactly. I need to shit my pants so I can be lighter and more uh, yeah. it's aerodynamic so yeah, I can right. run or I'm going to have to stay here and fight. You know, yeah. like it's that response. That's it. You know, so it's it's hard. I will not lie. It was it was really, really effing hard. <laughs> but did it uh, nerve wracking watching a TED talk? Like, yeah, it really is. It's like, well, yeah. Man. And you realize the people that sort of like when you watch because I watched a lot of them, the people that sort of look real, you realize it's, you know, it's very very rehearsed and it has to be there's no reason that they shouldn't but the people who look super relaxed and they're smiling all the time that's rehearsed like everything's rehearsed of the course whole, the, the whole nature of it coming off as if it's just hey hey guys let's have a fireside chat we well, you know you know there, is completely fabricated there's a there, there's a there's a uh, there's a learning curve when you're just learning the words to something and you're saying it you know okay you can recite it around your house then there's a learning curve when you get in front of people. Mm-hmm. Then there's a learning curve when you get in front of a lot of people. Like there, there are a series of learning curves. So I imagine mm-hmm. the people who are most comfortable have probably delivered that version of that speech several times. Right. 
before they get and then it's sort of by rote at that point they yeah can just they can shut their eyes and do it yeah there are there are you know there are people doing ted talks that are motivational speakers or public speakers that are doing what they call the circuit you know what i mean and it's like here's my rap and i'm not one of those people i had a very specific message to get across that was very complicated and i really wanted to get it across and uh so yeah, it was definitely nerve wracking. But it was fun. it was really really fun. I mean, I said to the guys afterwards because the the people who put it on are are amazing people and they're interesting and the other people there are really interesting and it was a real peak experience. It was just a scary one. Well, the, I mean, they are the the TED Talk rabbit hole is a very dangerous rabbit hole when you're watching one video and then you see in the margin five other ones that you're like, well, I gotta watch that and that and that and that. Yeah. And that. But I I always I'm always kind of tickled by the ones that where they. They do a little sketchy thing, a sketch kind of thing to to pull the audience in. Yeah, yeah. Or they walk out and they go, "Not this isn't literally what they do, but it's something like, like fuck you. Exactly. Did you see how you just felt just then? Did you feel that? <laughs> Did you feel that? This talk is about aggression. You know, it's like, like they, they do exactly. something that challenge. Yeah. And it's like, totally. oh, okay. That's like, I, see what, I see what you did there. Yeah. But it is. But I can imagine uh, – I've never done one, and I always thought, would I do one if they asked? And and I think I would be terrified too. The reason being that it it's there's it has TED talks have so much import now that if you're not saying something that's kind of weighty, mm-hmm. then I almost feel like oh, you're just wasting everyone's time, <laughs> and they're going to compare. Like, like there's a million other ones that are right. so engaging, right? You know? Yeah, there there is that, but there's also I think is if you know if you're entertaining, and I mean I think it is important that that you. Are entertaining. I think that you know they're, and you realize that there's a lot of them that you don't see, you know. Yeah, and most of the people that I saw give talks were really, really actually amazing. And and you watch it, you go, wow, there was a lot, a lot of amazing stories out there. But then you would get the odd one where the person just stood there, totally stricken with fear, and just uttered a really boring speech in a monotone for 15 minutes. And you'll never see that one. I'm here to talk about the pleasure centers of the brain. <laughs> exactly. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Mine are shutting off. Yeah. So what do you? So, so what was the? What was the arc of? Like, how much of the story? Like, what were you trying to get across in? Because you spend years making this film about mm-hmm. the deep web, and so what is the purpose of the TED talk? Well, for me, the the the, the TED talk was was not going to try to be encompass the film, but it was really going to try to encompass the thesis of the film, which was this this idea that that. The, the digital revolution and the implications of the digital revolution and the sort of the spin around what's actually going on, how all of this impacts everybody. And it's mostly about digital rights and privacy and about this notion that if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. And trying to explain to people that your privacy has always been a, a right, a human right, a civil right. It's a constitutional right. But we live in an age where it's slowly being not only eroded, but it's becoming kind of a bad word. We're like, if you say you want privacy, then you're obviously either doing something wrong or you've become one of the paranoid people, which is really a, an insidious shift in our culture. And that's really what I was talking about and how this idea of the dark net or the hidden internet or this thing that's become so kind of hyped in the media as being this haven for criminals is actually – only about it was been created by and used by people who want anonymity online. That includes criminals, just the way Los Angeles includes criminals. <laughs> you know, well, but it's, it's, it's such an, it's, it's not like, created by criminals. Yeah. It's not largely populated by criminals. It's not a dirty word to say that you don't want all of your shit out there. And like, if the if the Sony hack happens to you, or the Target hack happens to you, or the blue and the Blue Cross hack happens to you, and suddenly. Your medical information, your children's photographs are being sold by a Russian hacking website or on 4chan. Then you wake up and go, oh, I need privacy. Or the dumb joke that you made to who you thought was your best friend. Exactly. And then it, they're like, oh, this person's really – oh, no, I was just making a – Yeah. I mean it, it's, uh, it, it, it's interesting because I tend to think – that the idea of doxing someone is actually a big – like I feel like that's breaking internet code. Like you're not supposed to reveal someone's identity online. But at the same time, I do find it interesting that so many people have weaponized anonymity online mm-hmm. and you know they and they essentially use it to attack and tear down and you know sure. so so I know that it's not I mean I guess that's the take the good with the bad sort of a scenario I yeah. suppose Yeah I mean there's there is that but there's also the reality that um, there's a re- and what the talk is about is that there's there's an agenda there's a reason why people don't want you to to be thinking about your privacy and and that's not just tinfoil hattery um you know this notion of 
the tech companies and phone companies are able to do their job and make a profit much more easily if you don't have privacy. They're able to aggregate your voice recognition when you talk into Google. It stores every single word that you say. Um, it's often doing that actually without your permission, and it's using that voice recognition. Guys, I'm a little concerned right now because Alex has just been making this movie, and he has his front-facing <laughs> camera taped over. <laughs> <laughs> he does have the front-facing camera taped over. What does he know that I don't know? Uh, oh. That I prefer not to have my face recorded all day long and then use for various recognition <laughs> applications to increase Google's bottom line. So, you know, the, the, the problem is, is with all the stuff that's being collected is how is it being used and then what – how it can get exploited because of the way hacking works. So it's not, you know, yes, the government is, is bulk collecting information. Yes, that's not a great thing. There are problems with the way the government's functioning. But then there's just the fact that once your information gets hacked or if people get hacked and that stuff gets taken, it can get used in ways that you may not want. So the issue is a lot more serious than just, oh, I've got nothing to hide, so I have nothing to fear. And, right. and people who have been hacked – and we all probably know someone at this point who does, they will tell you it is a real problem for them. It's a viola- – their medical records, some of which they may not have wanted, their employers to even see are now public information. Well, it is a viol- – I mean you feel – violation is the perfect word for it is that you would feel completely violated, that something private about you – I mean it would be – you know, the, is, is now just out in the world. And once something is out in the world, you can't get it back. I mean there's no – right. it's pointless to even try to sue people to – you know, for people – whose photos got hacked from their phone or, or yeah. what? I mean, it's like, well, it's out there. I mean, yeah. you know, like you can plug up one leak and 30 more are going to spring up. Yeah. I mean, the door on your bathroom, I think, is the best is the best analogy. It's like, because it, it really is. It starts with something that subtle of just your, your own human desire to have privacy or a blind on your window. So the notion that you don't need privacy in the digital space, which is basically in this day and age, the only space because your entire life right. is on your cell phone, right? Your entire life is on your computer. And there are major, there's major legal reform going on now up at the Supreme Court level about what police can and can't do with your phone and your computer because your whole life is on it. So these are really big issues. And, you know, on all these different levels, so what I'm sort of getting at is, is the emperor's new clothes idea. It's like, well, yes, none of us have any clothes on. Everybody's looking and that's not okay. And I talked to my kids about this because I got a 17-year-old and he's part of a generation that's beginning to take back their privacy. We're, we're the anomaly generation, I believe. We're the ones that were so overwhelmed by the digital revolution. We're just like, fuck it. Who cares if they're looking at me and all my stuff? I don't care. I just want to use Twitter. Yeah. You know, whereas my teenager's like, the hell with that, you know? And so... Thankfully, you know, post Snowden, a lot of people are getting concerned about this. So privacy and encryption technologies are being baked more into everyday applications because you don't want to have to think about using encrypted email. You just want your email service to have it baked into Apple Mail or whatever. Mm. You don't have to think about using cloaking devices on your or VPNs or whatever on your browser. You want Firefox or Safari to have it baked into their browser. You don't want to have to worry about it. And that's what's coming. Uh, privacy business and movement is coming. Um, and in a way, we will be the one schmuck generation with all of our stuff out there. <laughs> and uh, thankfully, our children will probably be a little less cavalier about their privacy. You know, I think the unfortunate side effect, too, is that you said, you know, of course, when you talk about deep, the d- deep web, like you said, oh, it's like Los Angeles. Of course, there are criminals there. There are also not criminals there. People just, And I think it's sort of a bummer that the word hacker has such a negative connotation because by and large, hackers are not evil people. Well, yeah, hacking originated actually not as a pejorative at all. Hackers were, I mean, Wozniak was a hacker. Hackers Hackers built the revolution that we're in now. Hacking, you know, there's a lot of hackers who exploit flaws to then show, hey, uh, this is so something bad. I'm telling you that this was easy to to get into. You need to plug this hole or you need to make this more secure. And I think it's just a handful of people that do the bad things that give it, you know, that, that give the name a bad name. There's also the media spin on it. I mean, that's part of the problem. Hackers yeah. getting into here. Like, there's exactly. a lot of good hackers. I know they're good hackers. Yeah. Well, hacking is just, I mean, it doesn't mean anything negative. It's just a term for people who are doing certain things in the tech space. And, and it's, it's, been, it's been demonized by the media and by, again, I'd say by people who have, you know, either fear of technology, which is understandable because it's scary and it's pervasive, or a desire from business or governmental purposes to maintain control. There's a lot of fear of loss of control. It's something that I looked at, you know, with Napster. 
uh, when I was doing Downloaded was, you know, it wasn't just the record industry that was scared of these guys. The government was scared of these guys. And the media industries were scared of these guys. A lot of business was scared of losing control to what they saw as these hoodie-wearing miscreants who wanted to, <laughs> you know, take all their all their marbles away. And really, I mean, some of it's just fear of change and some of it is just flat-out desire for control. And the Deep Web movie was sort of upping that conversation to a whole other level because once you're demonizing, you know, privacy and encryption services, which are being, you know, utilized by government agents around the world and are extremely necessary, then suddenly the, this, this mythologizing, this demonizing is, has, has kind of gone too far. It's been taken to another level. And that's what we saw uh, a lot with the Silk Road case. No, so what is what was the <laughs> what were some of the things that you learned horrifying things that you learned throughout this process? <laughs> well, a l- I learned a lot. Um, I mean, I knew a lot about this world. I knew a lot of cryptographers and people in this world from doing the work on Downloaded and other, you know, uh, associations I've had in that space. But what was really most surprising to me when I started interviewing, and I'm, you know, I was interviewing through encryption, and because of my relationships, I was I got really inside the Silk Road uh, and knew. And was dealing directly with most of the core architects uh, of the Silk Road. And, uh, so you're dealing, you're talking about, you know, the technologists who had built it, the people who had sort of created the Bitcoin um, uh, technologies that allowed Silk Road to work with Bitcoin, which were complicated, large scale drug dealers, heroin dealers, people like that, um, who I was talking to, the vendors, buyers, all of that. Um, every single one of those people I talked to, and this was totally surprising to me and not what I expected, all of these core architects of the Silk Road, all of them um, had political motives and came from a political background. So um, I expected to just find a couple of sort of like you know corner drug mm-hmm. dealer type people, and I'm sure they exist. And I talked to a few people who were buyers who were like, look, I just wanted to – you know, buy and sell my marijuana or whatever. They were fairly low key, but the real people who were driving that site were politically motivated. And it's not shocking if you were on the Silk Road forums because all they talked about was sort of using technology to dismantle the drug war, use you know, trying to create a large scale anonymous community to end run privacy and encryption problems that were going on, and to create an anonymous community the way Napster created a, a big global internet community. Um, and they were taking risk. You know, they were risking their entire life basically because getting caught for moving that amount of drugs is a life sentence as we saw with Ross Ulbricht. Um, and he didn't even move drugs. He was just you know, charged with creating the site. So they were taking this risk because of intense belief in these ideals and that doesn't exonerate them. These people were – some of them were flat-out criminals. Some of them weren't. Some of them were occupied activists and people like that. They weren't really from a criminal space. Some of them were absolutely digital criminals. But they really believed that this was the only way to circumvent the drug war. And the drug war was evil. People were getting killed. It was mostly being used to put you know, nonviolent, mostly minority you know, minorities in jail at, at, an, at an increasing rate. Um, and they were extremely radical, reckless, young idealists. And that was primarily who I found. So it was this, it was like a really gnarly version of Napster. It was like, it was like taking the, the renegade nature that I found when I met the Napster guys and just upping it by an enormous degree. Um, that was surprising. I didn't expect to find this kind of, you know, and they weren't unified. They were from all different, I mean, some of them, they weren't like a, um, another misnomer at Napster was like this libertarian haven. The main guy who created it had libertarian leanings, but some of them were extremely anti-libertarian. They were sort of like almost, you know, pure anarchistic type people. Some of them were very socialist and really wanted to sort of eradicate um, kind of what they saw as more fascist tendencies that the drug war mm-hmm. was promoting. So that was really surprising to me that, that that it was that politically motivated. Do you think even in this community where – because I think um, <clears throat> obviously – for something to be organized, there has to be a structure. And when there's structure, some type of politicking is always involved because there has to be a hierarchy of how things are sorted and delivered. Or there has to be sets of rules. You know? So is it what, – what, what types of rules exist there to keep – you know, to keep people on is track. There a really an good honor question. code. Is there an honor yeah, code? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and the answer is there was. It was a trust based system, which is why it worked. It was also its Achilles heel. It was very similar to Napster. Napster worked because people trusted Sean Fanning and they felt that they knew who he was and they, there was this person there. It was a centralized technology. It was not decentralized, which means there was one server in one room somewhere, which means everything flowed through one central server 
and it was overseen. It had an ethos. It had forums. It had places you could go. It had a community that was very, very important to the people that showed up there. Uh, in fact, I would say I was on Napster because of the community. I didn't need more music by the time <laughs> I got to it. I had – I had bought my music nine different ways by then. I'd been suckered by the industry over and over again <laughs> in 12 different formats. But Remastered, fuck! Yeah, yeah cassette, you know, whatever, <laughs> each thing that came out. Yeah. DVD, I'll buy it again, why not? The whole Dylan catalog, sure, why not? Um, so by the time Deep Web, the, the Silk Road came along, it, it grew out of a political uh, movement, which was Bitcoin, um, the sort of uh, crypto... Uh, movement that was that was regaining strength around that time, a real pro privacy uh, generation that was coming up, and it was trust based. There was this there was a systems administrator that eventually went by the name of Dread Pirate Roberts, and everyone kind of assumed that was a number of people because it was that was why it was called the Dread Pirate Roberts. It was like this is a pseudonym, and we're all part of this movement. We're handing well, the down original this Dread Pirate Roberts is living like a king in Patagonia. Exactly. Yeah, Thanks. and uh, <laughs> precisely. Um, and, uh, and they congregated around the central server that was trusted. And, and the way the honor system worked was very similar to eBay, where if you, you rated your experience and if you did not have a high rating in terms of the quality of what you sold and the ability to, to get it to people and the ability to communicate with them and be present, you were gone. So <laughs> wow. it was, it was, there were, that's why I was able to get to the core architects because I immediately zeroed in on like the half a dozen people that were at the absolute top of that pyramid by providing the best service, being present, having an identity that people could could actually could connect with that <laughs> it's person. Like peer to peer quality control. That's what it was, and you know, and it was, and it had a, a, a very robust forum. You know, with thousands and thousands of people communicating, talking about books, philosophy, politics, all kinds of stuff. So it was a thriving, basically a thriving privacy oriented crypto community, which is extraordinary and unsurprisingly, like Napster. You know, this was its Achilles heel because once you got a server somewhere, someone's eventually going to get it. it yeah. And that's what happened with Silk Road. It was seized and they were shut down mm-hmm. and that was the history. But, you know, a lot of the, the copycats that have come up since then, and there are thousands of them, don't have the same honor. They're just like mercenary, you know, like we don't care about honor system. We don't want to know what books you're reading. What do I care? Just yeah. buy our stuff. It's, you just know? Like, it's just like floating through the town on Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, it's just like mob rule. <laughs> exactly. But, it, but, uh, you know, so as a documentarian, are you – is there any point where you're like, am I going to get in trouble? Like do, how careful do you have to be documenting this, interacting with these people? Like what protection do you have? Well, you have a lot. I mean I had, I had you know, really good legal team that like, you know, they did Citizen Four and all that kind of stuff and, and they know their way around this landscape. And, and you know, you have to remember that it's, it's pretty journalistic even though what I'm doing isn't journalism. I don't think of myself as a journalist. It's journalistic in the sense that I'm not – committing any crimes. I'm not uh, aiding and abetting anyone. Silk Road was over by the time I started my movie. It was shut down. It was over. So, um, you know, I was talking to the smoking embers of that site. Uh, I didn't really have anything that um, – and frankly, if anyone would have asked me information, you know, it's, it's – uh, I wouldn't have been doing anyone any, any harm because the, the people that they were after had already been apprehended. And, um, you know, yeah, I have sources that are at large, but uh, you know, I don't have access to who what their actual names are. Right. And um, you know, I shot one or two of them, but then I destroyed all the the media other than baked in, you know, uh, which is completely within my rights. So <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting. The very yeah. thing that you were studying actually almost kind of gave you the protection. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you have to, you know, you use encryption and you don't, you know, you don't do anything stupid and you don't break laws and uh you know, there was really – there was no point – and, you know, in a way, because the people that I was talking to, some of the people that I thought I was going to be most nervous around were the most – actually the most rational and intelligent. Like – and that was uh, that was surprising. But a couple of the really big dealers uh, were extremely educated and in retrospect, I realized it wasn't that surprising. To have been able to have run successful business of that global scale – encrypted and anonymous. The internet is a terrible place to conduct crime for the most part. It's really hard to remain anonymous on the internet. Really, really hard. And if you screw up just a little bit and you like go, oh yeah, it's like four in the morning, I'm tired. I can't remember which pseudonym I'm using as I log into like some obscure forum to ask a question and you use an email that is in vaguely connected to any email you've ever mm-hmm. used in your dark net, sort of you know, anonymous, you're done. I mean, that it's like boom, 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 done. Those dots get connected in two seconds. So it's very, very – you have to be super, super smart 
to actually succeed in that area. And the people that I were talking to, even the ones that I talked to some who had done jail time who had been caught because the feds were very, very good at catching these guys, um, they were super, super smart. They were really, really smart. And, you know, so they weren't going to be your average corner drug dealer. And they weren't like cartel people because that's the other thing you have to understand about this. What I always laugh about the dark net, you're de- you know, it all sounds really great and giant and like the stuff of, of Hollywood. But, you know, compared to the physical drug trade, you're talking about like the entire dark net crime world, you know, is like one street corner in Baltimore on a Thursday night. <laughs> I mean, it is tiny. It's tiny. So it's, you know, cover of Time Magazine, cover of Rolling Stone, whatever it is, like cover of Newsweek. Well, it sounds so ominous. It sounds it does, ominous yeah. and it also, you know, is it a – is it foreboding? Like is this is this telling us what the future is going to be? Is there going to be some sort of a – is it going to break off and become – The funny thing is is that the future that, it, that it's predicting is actually a positive one. And it's not even a negative one. That's that's the really the really sad thing about the way this thing has been demonized. And again, it's not to condone it all. It's just to look at it in a philosophical light. Like, is the sky falling? No, it's not. Actually, the drug war is a horrible failure. It's winding down. Everyone thinks it's a failure. It's it's you know been going far too long, and it and it does not help people who need help with drugs. It doesn't help the sort of mental health side of drugs, and it certainly doesn't help you know nonviolent offenders who are stuck in jail for exorbitant sentences and. Not you know to talk about the, the amazing profiting that's going on and the cartels and all the rest of it. So you have that issue. But you also have the fact that, that technology um, is how the drug war will be replaced because as is often the case with young, radical, crazy, idealistic renegades who aren't thinking enough about their, their well-being if they get caught and lose the rest of their life in prison, is that they're usually the first people through the door to create innovation that needs to be created. And the fact is, is that we will see online drug services that are legitimate. We will see online drug services that help people that need help, that have community built into them, that allow us to start to pull back on this, the heinous drug war, they will, be, they will end up getting regulated. They will be fully legal. But that is a, absolutely the way things are going. But they're starting the way all things do with contraband. Mm-hmm. They're starting with, with people who are taking risk. And, and is it all uh, – is it every kind of – Drug in the world? Is it every? Is well, it, it's is mostly like, marijuana. I mostly mean, again, marijuana. You, again, you know, it gets, you know, the, the sort of red scare, fear mongering spin is that, you know, your nine year old could end up accidentally buying heroin, or, and which is, you know, it's always the children. Think of the children. The, the last thing they're really thinking about is the children. Um, the reality of it is, is, is by far the majority of drugs that were sold on Silk Road and all these other sites is pot. By far, by a huge margin. And then, yes, there are hard drugs being sold and there are primarily, again, it's a much lower margin and it's primarily because of the difficulty of, of navigating drugs and, and the dark net and Tor and the various applications you need to do this. Is not, you're not talking about first-time nine-year-old I'm just I'm curious also, I'm, I'm interested. I'm, I'm curious about like you know, the pharmaceutical industry and – you know, guys like Martin Shkreli and, you know, when he goes, oh, well, we should, you know, charge $700 a pill for something. And then yeah. does that mean, you know, well, then a service like this allows people to get prescription drugs that they need? Well, for- what's happened? With that, there has been that case. I mean, you know, there, it is messy. So, I mean, I'm always loath to sort of look at it as some kind of immediate panacea. There's a lot of work to be done for this to become something that everybody can use properly. And for it not to have dangers and for bad things not to happen there because, of course, they do happen there. It's not without bad things happening. But, you know, for instance, uh, there was a great article, I think, in Motherboard where they talked about um, a woman who, because of her insurance, was unable to get her asthma medication, which she absolutely needed for her to stay alive. And so they bought it via the darknet markets. And, you know, she got basically got her asthma medication from a, a Silk Road equivalent, and that's how she was able to, to maintain Right. And, you know, so again, there's, and there are, that's the thing about the internet. And I went through this with Napster, you know, it causes upheaval. People get hurt. There are casualties. But the, when there are problems, there, you know, there's usually some ra- young radical person who's looking to solve them. Technology is a really good way to solve them a lot of the time. They know how to do it and they're not encumbered by things like the law. Well, it's also technology is the only thing that everyone has access to right. that has that much potential. 
power and influence. Completely. I mean, Sean Fanning was 18 years old and could not be more poor, came from an extremely, you know, working class family, but he had a laptop and he was incredibly smart. And look at what, you know, how much global change he brought on. And I would say the same, you know, for the creators of the Silk Road. I just think that they they looked at, at the world and the way, and some of these people weren't even that tech savvy. They had to find people that were tech savvy and delegate to them. But um, they had vision and they looked at the world and they thought, well, this, you know, there's a lot of things that are going wrong in our country and in the world right now and a lot of laws that make no sense and a lot of people that are being hurt. And I think this would actually be beneficial. And it's radical. It's reckless. It's illegal. But it doesn't stop them because they have – it doesn't take much more than a network of people on laptops to facilitate it. So when you think about this uh, this sector – you think of it as oh a place where pe- you you think of it as being privacy like like th- a place where people can go to ensure their privacy but obviously a lot of the narrative is a place where people go to conduct and so do you would you say that it's the same thing as you know, if a drunk driver runs someone over, then someone goes, well, we shouldn't have cars because well, cars kill people. Like, sure. Well, some people kill people in cars. Yes. But by and large, that's not, you know, the functionality of a car is is like you said, it's a neutral and it's whatever you apply to it. That's absolutely the issue. I think that that, you know, you even had that with the advent of cars. Any any change in the way human culture works causes panic. And when the automobile showed up, the government tried to prevent the automobile from happening for the same reason they've tried to prevent the darknet from happening because of contraband. They claimed, and this is a fact, that cars should not be a, you know, allowed to mass proliferate because they can't see in them and people could use them to move contraband across state lines. And that's true. That's an historical fact. So we're seeing- I just like to use it to bring fruit into California. <laughs> That's From your Vegas, story, and you're yeah. sticking to it. Oh, pop that trunk, pal. So you I know. bought those oranges in California. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's it's a similar type of thing. It's like you you know the the the, the internet does is the beginning of the digital revolution. We're at the very beginning of it. A lot of people are are very scared and see a lot of a lot of their control. I mean the, the, the away. scale not of it to, the not scale to of it digress, but that agricultural stop in California when you're coming from Vegas <laughs> is forty five miles deep into California. Yeah. Like it's if like what the bring in, fuck are you if doing you're gonna bring it, in putting fruit it flies, here? Yeah. Already, exactly. <laughs> you know where the fruit flies come in when you're throwing the fruit out the window before you get to the agricultural stuff. Okay. Continue talking about <laughs> it. Right, yeah. But you know, I think I think part of the thing that I think is scary about it for people is is the is just the scale. You know? Like yeah. an automobile is you can only fit so much in one tiny car, but the scale of what this, you know, this the connectivity of the internet is uh, is I think that's what scares the shit out of people so much. It's just the the large scale on which you can affect things. I think there's that, and I think it's I think you know because that is somewhat degree to some degree a misnomer in the sense that that they always amplify the scale. You know, sure. the Silk Road was talked about as being way bigger than it ever was. They sort of took the Bitcoin price when it was at its highest, and they said that that's what was moving through the Silk Road, which was like ten times less than the numbers they were floating around. You know, the the, the scale of these things. Like the trunk of your car isn't that big. If you compare this this sort of criminal activity to the drug cartels or or real physical world activity, as I argue in my TED talk, the for all the talk of child you know prostitution and trafficking on the darknet, of which there is very little, um, negligibly almost really almost none compared to the surface web where it's all over the place. You know, it's being de- it's actually being demonized. So. There, there is a bit of an agenda at work there. So it changes a little bit from, you know, the quote of, well, one drunk driver doesn't make the whole highway bad because there is a political ethos behind a lot of what's going on on the dark net. And that scares people, too. So it isn't just the idea that this thing could proliferate and be so big. It's that sort of what we were saying before, that it's the d- democratized nature of it, the fact that anybody anywhere that they can't see and they can't control could pick up a laptop and plug into something and, and enact change, no matter who they are and where they are, that is what's scary. And the fact that a lot of the people who are building these sites, like the Silk Road, are doing it for political reasons, that is terrifying to power structures. Like the, the, you know, the idea – the word anarchy is more scary to someone you know, in government or big business than almost anything that you can think of. You know, they're less scared in some ways of massive drug cartels or you know, entire third world countries are wiping themselves out than some kid in Ohio on a laptop who's talking about anarchy. So well, that's, what's so that's interesting, part of it, the problem. It's kind of like what you said though that it 
ultimately, it's almost it's almost Big Bang in nature where it's like, oh, well, there's anarchy in the beginning because everyone's scrambling around. But then after a while, as communities form, they it, it like anarchy doesn't sustain. Of course not. Because yeah. people do ultimately have to deal with each other. And if yeah. you're dealing with other people, then they structure has to naturally And they get form. old enough to get jobs and enter the real world and they stop being 19 years old. And that <laughs> stuff, you know, they realize that this isn't just like in a comic book and – you know, it's of course it's, these these are sort of this is the the shape of the early days of of you know someone who has a radical idea and being young and think you know saying I'm going to change the world. It's it's you know a lot of these settle down into probably for some people who are radical, very mundane and everyday kind of of uses, which is we're, what we're seeing happening with Sean Fanning's peer to peer brainstorm is really becoming something that everybody can utilize and is and has been driving everything from the Arab Spring to Netflix to basic technologies that we use today. Um, so, you know, and, and Sean, I remember when I met him, you know, his radical vision was over really early. He's like, God, what have I done? This is a nightmare, you know? So it's, you know, and he went on to create gaming technologies and really, you know, stuff well within the status quo. Um, you know, so I think that there's, I think that a lot of this is, is paranoia and panic. And, uh, you know, we do need encryption technologies. I mean, thankfully the mathematicians that build these things are really smart and they can usually outsmart, uh, you know, uh, attempts to sort of break these technologies and they can come up with better forms of encryption. And, you know, the world does need privacy and, you know, it does need to be fought for. And, you know, that's something that I think future generations are going to be aware of for sure. You know, well, is it as simple? Because obviously I know you have a Twitter account. I know you do exist in social media. Yeah. So what what habits did you change since you, you know, when you started, I use encryption all over the place. You know, I think it's it's up to you. It should be up to you how much of yourself and your life you want to expose. Just like in the, it's no different than the physical world. You know, you, you we give of ourselves to other people in the physical world as much as we feel comfortable with, and we don't to the degree that we don't feel comfortable with it. There's a lot. That was sort of what I argue about. There's a lot that we want to hide in this sort of, you know, nothing to hide, nothing to fear world we live in today. There's a lot of things I want to hide. They're not, I don't want to hide them because I'm committing crimes. You know, I want to hide them because they're, they're my personal business and I don't want them out there from medical records to personal child photographs to whatever. Um, so there's very easy ways to function in the, and I'm very present in, in the digital world and I like that. I like, I love digital communities. I've been involved in them since the 80s. You know, I got into the BBS era in 86 or 87, and I love digital communities. I think they're, they're incredible. But, you know, I use encryption. I use a virtual private network on my browser. I use Tor when I need to use Tor. You know, I use encrypted email when I use it. I use encrypted text uh, most of the time. Um, and I don't use difficult apps. I know probably more than the average Joe about this stuff, but it's getting, it's gotten, even since when I started deep web, it's gotten much, much easier to use these tools. These tools are getting easier and easier to use. And I'm glad that I use them. There are times I send an email that like, or a text, I'm like, even on a personal, like, Oh, if that would have gone to the wrong person, they would have gotten their feelings hurt, you know, unnecessarily just even trivial personal stuff. This isn't about like, I don't care about the, um, the NSA, you know, my concerns about, about bulk collection and the NSA have much more to do with what if that information falls into the wrong hands and the fact that I don't want my stuff taken without uh, certain laws being in place that I think are, are fair. Yeah, and, and every – fucking everyone says stuff in the privacy of their home to their family, their friends or like – Oh, it's a good thing no one heard that. You know, like everyone says dumb Not things. Not me, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> That's a button pusher. Yeah. But 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 there's so many things that uh, that we need to, and I think most people don't know. So for mobile, what type of encryption do you use for when you're using mobile? I use um, Signal, and uh, I use. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a bunch. I use Wicker. Uh, which is really good for text. Signal has now become really good for text. Uh, Tor now has a messenger uh, for your desktop, which is really good. Uh, Wicker also has a desktop uh, messenger app that's really, really good. Super easy to use. PGP for email is baked into a lot of different mail apps now. Like Apple Mail has a has a PGP um, function, which makes encrypted email incredibly easy to use. Um, you know, these, these things, and, and I use encrypted phone, I use signal for encrypted phone when I need to. So now encrypted phone, you know, is, is something I, if I'm do, working on a, 
a story like Deep Web where I just have to be careful what I'm saying to who and where I'll use that. I don't really have much use for encrypted phone conversations. Um, but encrypted text is extremely – I think is extremely important. And I think encrypted email a lot of the time is also extremely important. I mean look at what's happening to people in hacks. And um, I don't keep stuff on – the. I don't keep my personal information on the cl- on any cloud. You know, um, it's not like I don't trust Apple and I don't because, you know, because <laughs> um, they'll hand your stuff over to anybody and almost notice maybe slightly less quickly than I Google. I don't keep shit on the cloud. But, but not much, you know. Um, and uh, but I don't keep my, many of my personal photographs on the cloud. I don't keep any of my family information my clouds on, the on cloud. a hard drive in my house. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's my stuff is physical and it's very and my passwords are really tight. Now, that doesn't mean I can't get hacked. Of course I can. I've been hacked before. But my chances of getting hacked are significantly less than someone who's not doing any of these things. Cause it's like a robber. If you've even got a little crappy bolt lock on your door, if he's going around the neighborhood and all these doors are open and he gets to yours and there's just a bolt lock, he's going to go to the door that's open. Yeah, and it's the same with hacking. It's just they're gonna they're gonna go into the most easily accessible yeah, the one time device. I got, the one time I, w- I I got to go to DefCon one year uh, in Vegas several years back, and yeah. there, there was they had um, Lock Pick Village where people were picking actual locks with the idea being like, yeah, yeah if someone wants to get in, they're gonna get in. Mm-hmm. Like we, you know, these that basically we we have security to create the illusion of safety. But ultimately, if someone's determined enough, they're going to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if some, you know, someone could get into any one. I'm, I'm not doing this for, you know, I'm doing it as a preventative measure, just like I have a lock on my door. If a burglar wants to get into my house, whatever alarm I have, whatever, they're going to get in. Right. You know, but the, but the way these technologies and the way the hacking and the, these phishing technologies work, a lot of times it's random anyway. It's bot. It's just somebody just trying all these different doors all the time. And if yours is open, then they're going to go in yours. And if yours isn't, they're going to move on to the next one. All I know is when I I get an email that says change your Gmail password <laughs> and the link is a weird looking URL with numbers. Yeah. You should do that. You right? should do that. Absolutely. Right? I mean, that's yes. the where you Always go in and, you, yeah. and I'll just throw my extra. Yeah. So Please you know. reset your password. <laughs> yeah. I get, I mean, I get like 90 of those a day. <laughs> yeah. From one, three, seven, nine at Apple cloud. Yeah. Com. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Hi, this wow. is your mom at xxx.com. <laughs> not, so. go click on not a phishing scheme at all. <laughs> well, I recognize Biz. Some of these words, yeah. this must be legit. If you want ten thousand dollars from an Ethiopian prince, please type in your social security number. <laughs> oh well, when, when, when did Gmail start putting all of their text in Arabic? All right, yeah. well, it seems exactly. legit. I guess I'll uh, <laughs> click on this. Yeah, so that's the you know that's the world we're in, and um, it's it's some crazy stuff. But uh, I'm just about done with that story at this point, which is is nice. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're on to the next one. And uh, now I'm on to the next one. Yeah. What's the next one about? Uh, Frank Zappa. Oh, oh, nice. Yeah. I'm doing That's a, fantastic. Just out in Lower Canyon. Just yeah. Enjoying yourself. I've, yeah. Known, I've known the Zappa since 1994. There you go. They're the best. Yeah, they are great. They're a lovely family. Moon and Amit and Moon's ex husband, Paul, and oh, there was such a great group Nina Gordon and Lily Taylor. And we were all in a karaoke group for like three years. Yeah, it's great. And it was, they were fan, such a great group of people. Yeah. I'm so happy. They're the best. Yeah. They are the best and amazing. So is it, is it is it refreshing to to work on a documentary where you're not like digging up you know like yeah. really intense? Yeah, I was like, I'm, well, you use know, that encryption. You don't want Dweezil to see what you said to Amit. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um, the uh, yeah, I was I was really eager to to plunge into something that wasn't tech related. Yeah. You know, I mean, I I love Zappa, and there are things about Zappa that are actually simpatico with the type of protagonist I like telling stories about, which is not unlike, funnily enough, Ross Ulbricht and Sean mm. Fanning in a way. But Shaking up the system, guys? Yeah, you know, kind of dual, dualistic natures, people that are, are polarizing, people that, you know, you can't neatly wrap up in a bow. So, you know, you may look at them as a hero, as a villain, as whatever, and, and people that are politically charged um, are connected to their times, uh, but also operate on the sort of high creative level. Sure. Interesting. You know, I didn't do it intentionally. I sort of like it, it kind of what compelled me, I think, to dive in. Um, my producer, Glenn Zipper, and I were sort of kicking around what to do next. And, and you know, we are huge, huge Zappa people. So Zipper's producing Zappa? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm, at, yeah, I'm working, actually working on three projects that all have double syllable Zs right now. My brain is starting <laughs> That's to so melt. That's so strange. But uh, so the Zipper Zappa, you know, project is uh, – is a palate cleanser in a way, but it's like a three-year monolithic palate cleanser. Sure. And then you're doing the project on Zappos, buying up downtown Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Zappa on Zappos by Zipper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, 
And then, uh, yeah, well, it's, you know, listen, you don't, you don't want someone to hack your email and get the Bill and Ted 3 script, which if you want to tell us what it is now, we could, that's fine. <laughs> you want to walk through it you know what? Just, step by step. Just start reading it to us. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Faded. Yes. <laughs> All I can tell you is that uh, it being a comedy, uh, we obviously, when you meet back up with us, our futures did not uh, transpire quite as rosily as they were predicted <laughs> as, as the last one ended. Oh, fantastic. So uh, it's uh, – God kind gave rock and roll and then took it away. Kind of like that. Yeah. So we uh, – yeah, we are not quite the um, the world leading – Also, I got news for you. That phone booth's going to stick out a lot more now. Yeah. No <laughs> kidding. It made, it made no sense then. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, there was that really yeah. great gag. I mean, it – it killed. I remember seeing in the theater in, in the original Richard Donner Superman. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great! Because yeah. because phone booths had changed. Yeah, and they were they were open air phone booths as opposed to. Yeah. So he yeah. walks up and he and he, he just looks up and down at the open air phone booth yeah. and then has to like run away and everyone yeah. laughed because yeah. oh those closed up <laughs> phone booths aren't they're less ubiquitous than they used to be. Yeah, and it's the same the same thought. That's it is. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, we are. It's all like you know us the times the phone booth even rock and roll itself is all like of a bygone era wait what did they what was the last you know i haven't seen bogus journey in a few years what was the very last where does bogus journey in bogus journey at the end we we come back we come back from the future yes and we have just figured we've just nailed all of it we have like these two beautiful little kids each you know we have nailed how to play our instruments and we oh, that's like, right you go take the intense lessons and yeah. then exactly. come back and, and we you come back and we the... play this awesome awesome and song and you're this kind of Fleetwood Mac group exactly at that point. Yeah. yeah exactly and then it ended with this sort of you know credit sequence which wasn't actually even in the script that goes on to sort of to jokingly detail, talk yeah. about how we've like solved world hunger and you know the arts are we've written the songs that have just you know basically turned the world around and created world harmony and become the the ones as as the great ones had suggested in the first movie we, was our destiny. So obviously, it being a comedy and it being twenty some odd years later, we have failed entirely. <laughs> 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 and you know, the I, I won't go into much detail other than to say that that as dumb as we are, we do we do realize that we know that in some strand of space time, we must. This was our destiny. So somewhere. It has to be our destiny, and that's what I'll leave you with. In terms, of, that's that our, is fantastic. That's our jumping off. Excited. Also, also, uh, kudos to the gag of swapping Missy with the dads. Oh yeah, fucking amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. amazing. <laughs> I mean, there, the, the, the bogus journey is so layered with so many jokes. Yeah, that you really need to understand. Uh, excellent adventure, adventure to see. It's true. To, to, in order yeah. to see, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. Will station yeah. be back. Uh, I don't want to give too much away. Okay. He doesn't want to give too much away. Understood. Yeah. Understood. But it's uh, it's you know being written by the same two guys as Great. Solomon and Chris, Chris Matheson. Matheson. Yeah, and uh, you know it's being produced by the same people. It's it's a really great project. Which and, I, and I, I'm I, I'm one of the people that knows that Denomalos is Ed Solomon backwards. There you go. You are correct. Yes, the yeah. villain Joss Acklin. Yeah. His name was Denomalos, which is Ed Solomon's name backwards. Yeah. The only the thing you may not have known was that, and I was a huge admirer of Joss, Joss Acklin, was that his. There was no character acting involved in in the, the groaning content with which he he uh, he uh, interacted with our two characters. He, he, <laughs> for some reason, just took an immediate dislike to both me and Keanu, like on day one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I can pretend to understand you two gentlemen. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> he was method. Maybe he was. Now, Maybe, now we'll never know. Aren't they also when? So Ed and Chris, aren't they in the? When they're performing the seance. the seance, yeah, and they're saying like the incantation is something backwards, and I can't remember. I can't remember what, what it is. is either. Yeah, but it's something like Ed and Chris rule the world. I think it's, that may be so, what it is. It's yeah. something silly like yeah. that, right? And they're in the Ziggy Pig scene in the, the first Ziggy one too. Piggy scene. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. so good. Ziggy yeah. Piggy Zappa Zappa. Yeah, oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> and uh, what else is there? Oh, Dean Pariso is directing. Who made uh, Galaxy Quest? Oh, Excellent. Cool. So. Oh, that's I didn't fantastic. mean to say. Yeah, that's, no, that's okay. That was, but it's yeah. actually what just actually yeah. came out. I know. Legitimately. I guess I'm gonna have to say it again at some. You're point. You're gonna be saying it again no, at listen, some point. I hope oh, it's God. so successful they remake that serial because that was some good fucking. Yeah, that was. It was made by Ralston, man. It was made by that a dog was, food company. Well, it was no a joke. Good fucking cereal. <laughs> it really it was. It was made by good Ralston. Cereal. You look at the box of cereal box. It's got a Ralston checkerboard just like your dog food does on it. Oh shit! And then you open it and you're not disappointed. You're like, no, this is exactly what I imagine my dog food tastes like. Great. 
a Bill and Ted cartoon, wasn't there? Was, there yeah, was, yeah, 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 yeah Hanna Barbera cartoon. We voiced a season of it. That's I had the yeah. cassette hole. Like I think you got it from the cereal. Yeah, like, yeah. It was a blue cassette was the phone booth. Yeah, yeah I that's had it. That. And I would put, you'd put like four tapes. Oh, in it. Yeah. Nelson Entertainment. I know. God bless them. Oh, I Nelson know. Entertainment. Yeah, somebody is sitting on a beach somewhere, like on an island off the coast of Barbados, just playing air guitar and not doing, <laughs> and not doing anything, drinking mai tais and playing air guitar. So and that's it. Deep Web is out now. Deep Web, iTunes, Amazon, Hulu, blah, 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 blah. All Excellent. That jazz. And yeah. you're working on this app event and, yeah. and, and, and this other thing that we talked yes. about, but we don't want to, I don't want to push you too much. Yeah. I mean, offline, if you want to tell me, <laughs> it's totally fine. Um, and you don't, yeah, you can't even save time frame or anything. Okay. That's fine. No. Okay. We're trying to do it expediently, is as much as I'll say. <laughs> Excellent. You have to, because if you wait too long, there's like windows, and if it shuts, you're like, fuck! Exactly. Like, it sounds like once Keanu's done John Wick 2, he's sliding over to Bill and Ted. I don't. He That's can't. What it he's not, like but to don't. Me. He's not That's saying anything. I'm not like saying. He's not saying anything. I'm yeah. just saying. You cannot break the, crypto- the cryptography of I Alex can. Winter's brain. <laughs> Uh, he is yeah. an impenetrable. If you do, force. DARPA will explode. I'm going to give you a DDoS attack right now to get that. Uh, <laughs> it's not anywhere on my computer. I put false dates and, on An my IRL computer. DDoS attack is just yeah. going, <laughs> what, is it? What, is it? what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? I'm ignorant. I'm ignorant. I'm requesting a date. I'm requesting a date. Request, 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 request data. Finally, you break down. I actually was getting close to breaking down right there. You almost had me. We nailed it. Yeah. My IRL. Uh, uh, infosec is really crappy. <laughs> You've been spending so much time creating digital security. Exactly. It's it's just, nothing I have to no your own brain. U- ultra vulnerable in the yeah. real world. Someone just comes up and pokes you. Oh, and you okay, here it is. My children's photographs, my medical record. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> so you are uh, you have all of that. <laughs> and I'm pulling my pants down for no reason. Uh, <laughs> So uh, you were just – it's just ALX Winter on Twitter, right? It is, yeah. yeah. There's no E in Alex. No, no. Someone yeah. else has that. Some guy in like in like Denver has it. I keep pleading with him to give me his Twitter handle. And he, he, he laughingly, mockingly refuses to respond. What a bastard. Yeah, no, I'm with him. I think good for him. I wouldn't either. Uh, is his name Alex Winter? I mean, it must be that or he's just, re- it's just sick. <laughs> <laughs> he's not like texting me back going, sure, for $20,000, I'll give you whatever you want. So I'm assuming that's actually his name, it which is fair enough. his name. That's yeah. fair. That's I'm not going to be it's some my name too. It's a- not my fault. a-hole and – yeah. Doesn't matter. All right, good. Well, uh, it's great to see yeah, you. Yeah, man, it's and, good to see you. Congratulations. Always. Thank you for coming back. Yeah, now. thanks, Chris. Yeah. Enjoy your burrito safely. <laughs> Encryptedly. Enjoy, enjoy your, your burrito. encrypted burrito. <laughs> there you go. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. 